be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest like sailors in a tempest together and it could be just you and me we'll be family just wait and see Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Lung Cancer Living Room. Thank you all for coming, everyone in the room, everyone joining from online, either in, uh, from the YouTube uh, channel and or Facebook Live. Welcome, welcome. We're happy to have you. Um, we're also very happy to have Dr. Uh, Jonathan Goldman from UCLA up to talk to us today about precision medicine, which um, is perfect timing. I'm, I'm going to read a little bit from an article that um, I read today. Um, which speaks to the importance of um, education around precision medicine from a patient perspective as well as a, a physician uh, perspective. So we're really excited um, to have everyone tonight. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to Dr. Goldman to introduce himself and tell us why, why he chose lung cancer as an area of specialty. Great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jonathan Goldman. I, I, I'm at UCLA. Uh, I direct the clinical trials and thoracic oncology program. I also do, uh, I'm the associate director of the drug development program. And uh, because lung cancer has been such a, a hot area of research, because so many drugs have been developed in lung cancer, it has been a remarkable place to have a career recently. Um, I came, I think, two years ago or so, and I and I pretty I, I recognize uh, some of the people, and it's um, it's it's really a tremendous thing that you've put together, and I'm just learning about the Go To Foundation, but um, I am certainly reminded of of why I why I do this, and it's it's wonderful to to get to see everyone not rushed in the you know not in a clinic, but uh, sitting down together and spending a little more time. Um, I trained here. I was at, at UCSF in Stanford, and so it's nice to come back, uh, come back to this area, which I definitely remember very fondly. Um, when I decided to study uh, cancer and lung cancer in particular, uh, I, I, and you can see from what people said, uh, this brings you very quickly face to face with, with uh, very intense parts of life, and, um, and that was something that, was, uh, that I felt able to, to be part of, and, um, and it was very meaningful. It uh, immediately became very meaningful to me. Uh, lung cancer, uh, over a, a relatively short amount of time, went from a disease where many patients, doctors, family members, uh, legislators, were very what we'd say nihilistic about that that therapy didn't make a difference that um, that it wasn't clear that treatment was worth side effects uh, and that it sometimes wasn't even worth seeing an oncologist or discussing treatment options and uh, when you look at it that way, what a remarkable change has happened uh, it, it didn't used to be that you could talk in a room with people that were you know, uh, three, five, six-year survivors, let alone, you know, 10-plus years. Um, that's not, that obviously, to say, we still have a lot of work. 
Yeah. At some point, and you don't, you don't have to do it now because maybe you need to do a little bit more to lead into it, but I'd like you to talk to patients um, tonight as well uh, because we're talking about precision medicine. Yeah. And, you know, one's Exxon 14, one's Exxon 19, and then we got Exxon 20, and, and how important those submarkers yeah. are becoming. So before we jump into that, would you, because I uh, I do want to get into some of the specifics. I want to kind of step back even even further. So, um, for the folks online who might be really early in the diagnostic process, or those who might come back and watch later, are are in that early sort of space. Can we can we can we step even back to the diagnosis and sort of what good looks like through that whole diagnostic yeah. process and and biopsying and testing for these mutations that you're talking about. What is a mutation? Maybe even why do they happen and why it's important to know what someone's mutation might be yeah. before determining a, yeah. a treatment. Yeah, well, I, um, I really uh, love getting these questions. And it's always clear when a patient comes, uh, comes from you who really understands their, their cancer uh, and, and the stories that we heard are, I, I think, a, a great way to to be a, a partner in the process and to uh, to not feel pushed along by the process, but to be an active participant in it. The um, so lung cancer, particularly, many patients here talked about thinking they so they had asthma or, or allergies or something. Sometimes lung cancer diagnoses do take longer than you would want, and. So at some point, a chest X-ray or a CT scan uh, or a new symptom shows that there's a, a mass in the lung. A very important part of, of the next step is what we, uh, so we, we need a biopsy to prove what it is and we need staging scans to, to see throughout the body where is the cancer at that point. Uh, the biopsies are, can either be done with a CT scan and a needle or, uh, or sometimes there are small surgeries that are done uh, to get at lymph nodes, for example, or a bronchoscopy where a lung doctor, a pulmonologist, will go down the lungs with a scope and, and grab a piece of the cancer. Then a pathologist will look at it under the microscope and say these cells are clearly abnormal. They're not behaving the way they're supposed to be. They're not following the lines of, of, usual, can of usual cells. And in this case, they look like lung cancer cells. There are proteins that we can find on the surface that, that identify a, a cancer cell as a lung cancer cell. We might be able to say this is the most common kind called adenocarcinoma, or maybe it's squamous cell. We didn't hear that much about another group called small cell lung cancer, but those would all be identifiable by the pathologist. The pathologist will also take or hope to take some of that biopsy and do what's called mutation testing. Um, a lot of times that is through sequencing, meaning that you look at your DNA, or the, you look at the patient's DNA. DNA is, is on a strand, one, one letter after another, and they will use these, these laboratory techniques to rebuild that strand in a way that you can tell what was there. And we, we know what the normal is. And there are, in many ways, predictable ways that that could become abnormal or mutated in a way that would promote cancer. It's a lot of words. Probably wouldn't hurt for me to say it again in a, in a different way. But the, um, the, the DNA determines proteins in your body that, that, that create the normal function. And a mutation in the gene leads to a mutation in the protein that can turn the on and off switches of normal physiology, normal biology, to become, to become wrong, to become dangerous. And, and, and sometimes that leads to cancer. We all, through our lifetimes, get mutations in our cells. And a lot of those mutations don't do anything. There are, there are whole regions of our DNA that are not important, that just have like the detritus of evolution. But, the, but some of them come up in very important areas. The reason why there are certain common cancers, uh, like common skin cancers or, or lung cancers, 
lung cancer in smokers is that there are some exposures that cause extra mutations, like tobacco or the sun, the UV light and sun. And that can cause hundreds or thousands of mutations. And just, you can imagine by chance, if you're getting thousands of mutations, one of those or, so, or, a, or a, a group of those could, could lead to enough abnormality that that cell becomes cancerous. Most of the time, though, across cancer, we don't know why those mutations happen. It's just the, the cancer, the growth process, the cell growth process is so complicated and happens so many times that the chance of having an error becomes real over 50, 60, 80 years of life. Sometimes that is reassuring to patients. It's not that they did anything wrong, but that this can just happen. Sometimes it's also hard to know that some of this didn't happen for any reason. I think there are, there are a lot of emotions that these, these events bring up. The, but what we, what we do know is that this is an important part of the cancer process. I said that some of these mutations happen more commonly in Asian populations. And frankly, we don't know why. There are, there are still some things that are yet to be understood. But through the, the late 1900s, people started to understand that an accumulation of mutations could cause cancer. And then really through the 90, 1990s and, and this century, we, we really became focused on what are the most important ones of those mutations? What are the ones that are driving the cancer, be it breast cancer or, or be it stomach cancer or, or lung cancer? And, and really, lung cancer in a lot of ways has, has led the charge towards this, this, medicine, this type of treatment. I'd been using target, targeted treatment, but, but we can also use the word precision medicine, meaning that it's the, the right drug uh, to the patient. And, the sooner the better, and the better the drug, the better. But the basic concept of, of identifying what made, what made this cancer cancerous ends up being very powerful in a lot of situations. I think um, we do have what well, we heard some of, of these uh, sequences of responses and resistance, and response and resistance with, with new and better drugs. But we certainly have our eye on the possibility of can we, can we do even better than that? There are a lot of different ways that we've learned to treat lung cancer. Uh, the standard older way is, is chemotherapy. And as we heard from some people, there, there really is still a role for chemotherapy. And, and actually, the only downside of all the new drugs that we have is sometimes people get so scared of chemotherapy that there, are, there is still a role for it. And, and sometimes it's, it's actually clearly the best option. Mm -hmm. And in fact, our, our lung cancer chemotherapy, very thankfully, is, is effective for most patients and, and tolerable for most patients. So that, that, is, that is a good thing compared to some other cancer programs. We also have added to that immune therapy just in the last few years. And often immune therapy can be added to chemotherapy. Uh, we do talk about PDL1, which was brought up as a marker, a predictor of benefit from immune therapy. But even aside from that, there, there, are, there are benefits to immune therapy. You can think of that as a targeted therapy. If, if a patient has high PDL1, you that that directs them to an immunotherapy course. But what I mostly am going to talk about in targeted therapy. Is, is another type of, of treatment um, that is based on finding a mutation and treating that mutation. And, and maybe a third, if not more, of the patients here described EGFR mutations. And uh, that's, that's definitely the most common of these treatable mutations. It's about 10, 12% in this country. In Asia, interestingly, not entirely for clear reasons, is much more common. 30% or so, this, this, these mutations are more common in never smokers or, or minimal smokers. And in, in that situation, it can be 30 or 50% of the patients. And I think that's really what you might call the poster child of targeted therapy in lung cancer, really where we first saw 
some of these early drugs, uh, Aresa or Jafitinib, some might remember. And it then, was Terceva. And then Terceva. Yeah. yeah, so the, um, uh, they actually were used in, because EGFR was thought to be important in general. And in some patients, there was very little benefit, but in some patients, dramatic benefit. A, a, a patient with cancer throughout both lungs, they would be cleared. And it wasn't immediately obvious why. And then wonderful research identified that those tumors had a mutation in this gene called EGFR that was causing a growth protein that should be turned on and off at the right time to always be in an on position and cause constant cell growth, out of control, not functioning well with the rest of the body. In a pill with, the, with a small uh, molecule in it that would block that mutation, turned that off. And, and it, it really opened up a world of, of targeted therapy in general, but especially for lung cancer. And increasingly over the years, about 15, 16 years now, we've been identifying new mutations. We, we think about the pie, you know, pie chart of, of cancer patients, and we get more pot slices of the pie as we understand some of these mutations. We're, we're a little bit better than 60% at finding what we call driving mutations in, in the most common kinds of lung cancer. And for many of those mutations, not all of them, but many of them were getting better and better drugs. So we talked about Tarsiva, and now we have Tegriso. For the next most common, called ALK, uh, we, we started out with Crizotinib, and now we have several new drugs. We've actually already on to fourth generation drugs. Uh, and what do we mean by these new drugs? What, what's remarkable is that these drugs are more effective, less side effects, and excitingly, better and better at treating some of the most difficult situations, such as cancer that's gone to the brain. So now, in, instead of going to surgery or going to radiation, we're often seeing, can we treat with a pill? And, uh, and, and so that can be quite remarkable, um, avoiding some of those side effects, or at least holding them off. Again, we still have this problem of drugs working for a while and, and then needing to look at new drugs, but some of these newer drugs are not working 10 months, but working 18 or 36 months, depending on the situation. So that's the way we've seen a lot of progress by, by building new understandings. We, talk, we heard about MET mutations. Uh, MET mutations were only described uh, a few years ago. We actually reported uh, the first time that, that crizotinib was used. Uh, and, and it was a patient who had uh, not done well on, on three different kinds of chemotherapy. Uh, and she really was unsure whether to go on more treatment. Um, and what we, what we did was, at that point, not yet standard or not yet commonly done, but did an extensive mutation screen to look for, are there some mutations beyond the ones that we know about? And we found this MET mutation. At that point, very little was known, but we decided to try a MET inhibitor, crizotinib, and, and, and just as you're describing, really a, a dramatic response. Those, those stories don't happen all the time, but I think what, what we, the way, one of the ways I like to think about this is just, can we provide more and more options? A patient may have to try two or three possibilities, but can we get to something that may work particularly well. Just today I saw a patient who, actually going on six years ago with EGFR, EGFR mutation, started growing very, very quickly. Probably in retrospect, she had something called a small cell transformation. Um, we radiated that area, put her back on Tarsiva, and then somewhat beyond our wildest, or, or absolutely beyond our wildest expectations, that has kept things under control for these many years. And you don't always know which of these different options is going to be perhaps a silver <laughs> bullet for a patient. But, but by having more and more of them and learning you know, increasingly what are our best ways to put this together, we hope to get have these incremental improvements and then Occasionally, we would like to have revolutionary improvements. 
There was a few other things I wanted to make sure that I focus on. One of them was just the importance of the mutation testing, um, particularly MET, because MET is, is a difficult one to test for, MET mutations. But in general, we, we heard several patients that were treated for a while before an EGFR mutation was found. We would like to have as much testing, as much identifying of mutations as early as possible. And that's one of the ways that patients really can improve their care, is by talking to their doctors about, have we done the, the testing that we need to do? Are there other things that we should consider now or in the future? There are so many different ways to test now. It's not, there's not a single solution for every patient, but we do have these broad tests that can test not just three to five genes, but hundreds of, or yes, hundreds of genes. Um, and, and it may be that that's the direction that we're all moving. But it's certainly appropriate to ask those questions. One of the things that's made the biggest difference for me as a doctor is that we can now test a lot of these mutations in the blood and we get the results in a week. It's, it's just remarkable what that can mean for a patient that's either just had their diagnosis or has gotten very sick. And, and those are things that really we didn't see. We didn't even, even when that became available, we didn't realize what a revolution it was until, until we, it de developed to be part of our practice. So, so we get the biopsy, right? And um, quite often, as some of you know, and as is one of my one of my pet peeves, um, and I complain about it a lot, is the percentage of patients that actually go on to get this type of profiling, the uh, the, the molecular profiling, right? Um, and it's one of the things, and I'll, I'll get to it a little bit later. But it's about the um, the article that I was reading today, and and in academic centers where Dr. Goldman. Um, works, it's happening with the appropriate patients, right? Where it's not happening with the appropriate patients is in the community setting, right? Necessarily, not all community settings, but 80% of patients, as you guys know, I say it over and over and over, it sounds like a broken record to those of you who show up every month, but 80% of the patients are seen in the community setting. And a lot of the, the, a huge percentage of those patients are seen in very rural areas, right, where there's a general oncologist who's treating whatever walks in the door. So um, in my opinion, it's an unfair expectation that they would know everything there is to know, especially with how quickly things are happening today in cancer in general, lung cancer for sure, but in cancer in general, all this molecular profiling. And then, oh, we found an EGFR mutation. Well, now what? What do I do with that, right? Which is what happens a lot, which again is why it's so important um, for GoTo to be able to provide education services like this to you all and those watching um, and to have these guys come in and talk. So what is, why is it important that we find out what the molecular makeup is of each individual patient? What happens once we know that? So there are some there are some still legitimate questions about should we be te testing everyone sure. and at and at what point? So it, it part of what makes it difficult is it's hard to make an across the board sure. recommendation. But we do know that that most lung cancer patients are diagnosed at stage four, and most are adenocarcinoma. The the plurality or adenocarcinoma. And in that situation, it's become clear that, that we do need at least the mutations tested that we have an approved drug for. We need those mutations tested. And I actually think that things are getting better faster and faster, but I don't know, I don't know the whole right. country. Right. Right. <laughs> but I do think that, that as we get drugs to treat patients, and as doctors, it's also a joy for the doctors to be able to treat someone successfully with one of these new medications. As that happens, I do think that people are doing more and more testing. But I do think at some point, a second opinion can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to feel a connection with your doctor. You want to feel that they're, that they're hearing you, that they can explain things and why they're doing something, and that, that you have the room to ask questions. Oh, I 
be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see